Chapter 14. Florac. On a branch of the Tarn stands Florac, the seat of a sub-prefecture with an old castle, an alley of plains, many quaint street corners and a live fountain welling from the hill. It is notable, besides, for handsome women and as one of the two capitals, Alais being the other, of the country of the Camisar. The landlord of the inn took me, after I had eaten, to an adjoining café, where I, or rather my journey, became the topic of the afternoon. Everyone had some suggestion for my guidance, and the sub-prefectorial map was fetched from the sub-prefecture itself, and much summed among coffee cups and glasses of liqueur. Most of these kind advisers were Protestant, though I observed that Protestant and Catholic intermingled in a very easy manner, and it surprised me to see what a lively memory still subsisted of the religious war. Among the hills of the southwest, by Moschlin, Kamnock or Kasfern, in isolated farms or in the Manse, serious Presbyterian people still recall the days of the great persecution and the graves of local martyrs are still piously regarded. But in towns and among the so-called better classes, I fear that these old doings have become an idle tale. If you met a mixed company in the King's Arm at Wigtown, it is not likely that talk would run on Covenanters. Nay, at Muirkirk or Glenluce, I found the Beadle's wife had not so much as heard of Prophet Paden. But these Sevenols were proud of their ancestors in quite another sense. The war was their chosen topic. Its exploits were their own patent of nobility. And where a man or a race has had but one adventure, and that heroic, we must expect and pardon some prolixity of reference. They told me the country was still full of legends hitherto uncollected. I heard from them about Cavalier's descendants, not direct descendants, be it understood, but only cousins or nephews, who were still prosperous people in the scene of the boy general's exploits. And one farmer had seen the bones of old combatants dug up into the air of an afternoon in the 19th century in a field where the ancestors had fought and the great-grandchildren were peaceably ditching together. Later in the day, one of the Protestant pastors was so good as to visit me. A young man, intelligent, polite, with whom I passed an hour or two in talk. Florac, he told me, is part Protestant, part Catholic, and the difference in religion is usually doubled by a difference in politics. You may judge of my surprise, coming as I did from such a babbling purgatorial Poland of a place as Monastier, when I learned that the population lived together on very quiet terms, and there was even an exchange of hospitalities between households thus doubly separated. Black Camisar and White Camisar, Militiaman and Michele and Dragoon, Protestant Prophet and Catholic Cadet of the White Cross. They had all been sabering and shooting, burning, pillaging and murdering, their hearts hot with indignant passion. And here, after 170 years, Protestant is still Protestant, Catholic still Catholic, but in mutual toleration and mild amity of life. But the race of man, like that indomitable nature whence it sprang, has medicating virtues of its own. The years and seasons bring various harvests, the sun returns after the rain, and mankind outlives secular animosities as a single man awakens from the passions of a day. We judge our ancestors from a more divine position, and the dust being a little laid with several centuries, we can, both side, we can see both sides adorned with human virtues and fighting with a show of right. I have never thought it easy to be just, and find it daily even harder than I thought. I own I met these Protestants with delight and a sense of coming home. I was accustomed to speak their language in another and deeper sense of the word than that which distinguishes between French and English. For the true Babel is a divergence upon morals, and hence I could hold more free communication with the Protestants and judge them more justly than the Catholics. Father Apollonaris may pair off with my mountain Plymouth brother as two guileless and devout old men, yet I ask myself if I had as ready a feeling for the virtues of the Trappist, or had I been a Catholic, if I should have felt so warmly 
to the dissenter of La Vernede. With the first, I was on terms of mere forbearance, but with the other, although only a misunderstanding and by keeping on selected points, it was still possible to hold converse and exchange some honest thoughts. In this world of imperfection, we gladly welcome even partial intimacies. If we find but one to whom we can speak out of our heart freely, with whom we can walk in love and simplicity without dissimulation, we have no ground of quarrel with the world or with God.